गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू आई एम डॉक्टर नीरज मानकड़ फैकल्टी एट फ्लेम स्कूल ऑफ बिजनेस एंड दी असिस्टेंट डीन फॉर प्रोग्राम्स एंड वेरी वेरी हैप्पी टू मॉडरेट एंड होस्ट दिस सेशन ऑफ फाउंडर्स टॉक द एथ इन द वर्जन विथ आर वाइस चांसलर डॉक्टर दिशान कामदार थैंक यू सर फॉर अग्रिंग टू कम ओवर एंड एंड टेक दिस सेशन and uh, thanks darshan for uh, you know, such a wonderful uh, series that you've been hosting a uh, lot of work i i i know you must have gone through and your entire team at the back end uh, so uh, i'm sure dr kamdar needs uh, no introduction uh, but for all of you who uh, have not uh, known dr kamdar uh just a short very short introduction about him he is the vice chancellor uh, of flame university uh, prior to joining flame university uh, sir was uh, the uh, deputy dean academic programs at uh, indian school of business in hyderabad uh, he was uh, one of the founding members of uh, isp there uh, he comes with a with a global uh, business background uh, having uh you know had his own enterprise in singapore and also having uh worked and 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 done his doctorate from nus in singapore uh dishan sir's uh, uh, area of speciality is in uh, leadership negotiation and decision making and uh, uh one thing about him is that uh, uh though he is as he likes to call himself behind the veil means always uh, he is a, a mentor and a coach to many ceos uh, as as well so uh, we are glad to have him here uh, to talk to us uh, leadership uh, and uh, uh, over to you sir uh, with this short introduction on uh, your session thank you <clears throat> sir neeraj uh, thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, i welcome each and every participant today in the audience well uh, i'll be talking about something that is close to my heart um leadership and i'm going to start off this session by making a, a very important point uh, according to me uh, leadership is over glorified you know we 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 have, we have written multiple books about leadership and we make the leader eventually you know the 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 big hero end of the day you know or the villain end of the day for making or breaking you know an institution uh, yes while leadership is very very important uh, it's also important for us to realize what makes a leader a leader right and, and in my opinion the answer is very simple you know the leader's core team defines that leader's success or failure right a leader's ability to identify members of his or her core team is very very crucial in determining the the, the organization success so a leader's job is essentially you know strategizing the way forward and delegating the task to his or her core team right so but the knack to identify the right person with the right signature strength to be in the core team is crucial and once you've done that leader's job is to just you know um, empower them and have weekly meetings and motivate his or her core team and that's it in my opinion that's leadership right in a nutshell but uh, you know i have been speaking to many leaders uh, you know especially uh, when i teach in the executive education program uh, you know folks uh, with 12 with with around 10 to Uh, 15 years of work experience they come to me and i interact with interact with them and the mindset that i've seen right when i interact with them most of my participants feel that leadership is all about you know telling my people what to do and how to do it right so the basic presumption is i am surrounded by you know people who are silly and my job is to tell silly people how to do their jobs well and i think that's a fatally flawed uh starting point you know in my view leadership over and above forming your core team and motivating them leadership is all about introspection it's all about you know thinking about your own cleansing moments because rather than changing people around you 
you rather change yourself. And the moment you introspect, you go through your cleansing moments, you change yourself automatically, you know, um, you know, people will all align and change and get motivated themselves, right? Uh, so today I'm gonna to talk about, you know, common mistakes that we make as leaders. Um, I'm gonna talk about around 10 to 15 mistakes that we often commit without realizing them and how important these mistakes are to be avoided. Right, I'm gonna start off and some of these points may be straightforward, but uh, you know, it's a reminder call for all of us. You know, if you wanna be a leader, you know, these are the 10 or 15 points that you need to consider to be effective in whatever you do. Uh, you know, uh, am I, so when, when I'm talking about leadership today, I'm referring to anybody out there in the audience, right? Um, you know, it could be students who take leadership positions. It could be managers, could be CXOs, could be CEOs. It applies to everyone, both in your personal and professional life, right? So uh, let's get to the first point. And I want to talk about the importance of being a good listener. I think this is extremely crucial, very, very important. And most of us, so when I teach a class on leadership or negotiation, the first thing I ask my students is, you know, how many of us think that we are good listeners? You know, I ask them to raise their hands. And almost 60% of them would raise their hands, sir, I think, you know, I'm a good listener. And for those, you know, for those of them who raise their hands, um, you know, who think they are great listeners, and I ask them a follow-up question. You know, whenever you are listening, are you listening to understand or are you listening to respond? There's a big difference between listening and hearing. And most of us, right, uh, go through your own, your own uh, you know, introspection right now. Whenever you're listening to your spouse, your employees, you know, your supervisors, whoever you're listening to, you know, you are listening for the sake of listening. You know, you, this guy is talking, let this person complete, you know, whatever he or she wants to talk. And then, you know what, I will say what I want to say. Right, so you are actually not listening to understand, you are listening to respond, and that makes you a bad listener. Right, so listening skills are very, very important. And why is listening important? Because if you do not listen, you don't understand the, the true value proposition of whoever is speaking to you. Right, so, you know, amongst all the leadership traits we talked about, we will be talking about today, in my view, being a good listener. If you're not, if, if you're a good listener, you know, whatever I, I, I talk to you today or whatever, you know, a leader, a leadership professor teaches you will be a future record. That's the starting point. A good leader has to be a good listener. Now, you know, I've, I've gone through a, a recent a research article, uh, you know, published last year. And, uh, you know, the, the article talked about, you know, how out of, uh, you know, the 170 CEOs surveyed, you know, how many of them are perceived to be good listeners by their subordinates and their stakeholders. And lo and behold, research shows that 92% of leaders are bad listeners. So we think we are good listeners because we are hearing, we are not listening. But, you know, 92% uh, of leaders are bad listeners. And uh, that makes me think, you know, let us, th let us introspect. Why generally is it so difficult for, for a leader to be a good listener? Uh, I, I can offer three suggestions. Number one is very straightforward, you know, ego or overweening pride, right? Because I'm the leader here and I'm not used to listening. I want people to, to listen to me, right? Uh, and uh, I will be talking about ego later on, but, uh, you know, as we climb up, right, we should shed ego and embrace more humility, but we do the reverse, you know, as we climb up, you know, we embrace more ego and we shed humility and that leads to bad listening. So here's a reminder call to all my leaders out there. You, 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 know, you, you have to shed your ego. You have to embrace humility to be able to be a good listener, right? So one reason that we are bad listeners is because of ego or overweening pride. Second reason why we end up being a bad listener is the fact that uh, you know, our, you know, our calendars generally are, are cluttered. So I ask most of my, most of my you know, uh, executive students, on an average, how many meetings do you have on a daily basis? And uh, the response I get is, sir, on average, we are busy and uh, we have on average six to eight meetings on, on average on a daily basis. Now, if you are cluttering your calendar and you're having six to eight meetings, how can you do justice to listening, right? But before I talk about just, any, just doing justice to listening, that seven to eight meetings you have on a daily basis, 
how many of them actually warrant your presence uh, and attention right uh, if you really introspect you will realize that half of the meetings you don't have to be there right the failure to empower is a big disease you know uh, where leadership is concerned we hire people so that our time can be freed up so that we can think strategy we can think 2.0 3.0 that's your job as a leader you know and if you do not have time to think about you know creatively how do i bring my organization forward and you get into too many administrative 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 meetings um, you know then you are in meetings where your presence is not warranted uh, your calendar is cluttered and if your calendar is cluttered you have 6 to 8 meetings on a daily basis imagine you are entering meeting number 4 right now half of your mind is thinking about meetings 1 2 3 and the other half is thinking about 5 6 7 right so half of your mind is is busy thinking about the, the the previous meetings and the other half is thinking about the next meeting you are in the past and future you are in the, you are not in the present and hence for you know you are unable to do justice to listen to the interactions with your client your supplier so whoever you are meeting with so as a thumb rule please remember if you are having people reporting to you then fully empower now some people will say you know what i can empower because this person is incompetent now if this person is incompetent then then you know what rotate this person and put that person in another department right or get rid of this person the reason why you have someone reporting to you is so that your time can be freed up i'm saying this again right and and if you have someone reporting to you you better trust this person right now some of you will say you know what i can't trust i i don't trust this person because when i have trusted people uh, they have taken advantage of my 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 kindness or my well being well uh, let me tell you let me remind you okay let me ask you a very simple question you know if you if you trust 100 people let's say 10 people right if you trust wholeheartedly 10 people how many of them will actually betray your trust maybe two maybe three then why are you penalizing this seven to eight people who will not penalize you right who will not take advantage of your trust right so so factor you know factor for this that 20% but it is very important that you trust your people as a leader right you trust people reporting to you So when you trust your people reporting to you, you don't have to micromanage. And when you don't micromanage, you don't have to clutter your calendar. And when you don't clutter your calendar, you won't have more than two or three meetings uh, on a daily basis. And then you can do justice to listening, right? So this is the second reason why leaders find it so difficult to be a good listener. I am so busy. My my calendar is cluttered. I think it's just an excuse. We like to pretend to be busy, and that's the fact. You know, you know, we 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 manage impressions. You know, as a leader. i would say you know 70% of your time should be freed up doing nothing you know should be 70% of the time should be utilized just thinking creatively on how do i take my organization forward how do i motivate my people you know how do i take care of their welfare how do i give them growth how do i give my stakeholders growth but if right so so um, so this is my point number 2 why is it so difficult to listen uh, point number 3 you know you are listening but you are not doing justice to listening because you are listening to what and not why you know the crux of design thinking talks about understanding customer value proposition right so you know whenever you are listening to um, you know a stakeholder a vendor don't ask them what you want but ask them why you want it and when you ask the big question why you are actually looking at the interest underlying the positions that they are taking you know i always use this example when i'm teaching my class you know two daughters fighting for an orange and you only have one orange in your kitchen and i ask my participants you know your two daughters are crying what would you do and the typical response i get is you know i will slice this into half and half and uh, and that's the problem i i i tell my students and why this is a problem because you you were listening to your daughters and you were listening to what you want and the bug stopped there you know you ask your children what you want and both kids saying mom dad i want the orange and you slice this into half and half now but if you went forward and if you move from what to why and if you ask your children tell me why you want the orange before i make that judgment call chances are you know one child would tell you mom dad i want the orange because i'm hungry and the other child would tell you mom dad i want the orange because i'm baking an orange cake and to bake an orange cake i need the peel of the orange 
right? So if you would have asked why, you could have you know given the one kid the entire pulp and the other the entire rind, the entire peel, right? And that's the that's the magical value of why, right? So so please remember leadership rule number one: be a good listener. And uh, to be a good listener, you need to move from what to why. Okay. Now, so these are the common mistakes we make. Um, mistake number two. Um, Generally, most leaders do not like to bring about change initiatives in their organization. You know, there is this little fear that when I bring about change, what if I fail, right? If I fail to bring about change, I'll get ridiculed by my people who are reporting to me, number one. And number two, uh, you know, what will my promoters think about me, right? But let me remind you, you know, the world that we are living in today so you could be let off in the past, say a decade ago, by not being a change agent. According to me, you know, uh, another word for leadership is change agent. As a leader, you have to be a change agent. Bring about change within your organization, bring about change outside your organization. That's your job as a leader. You don't have a choice. And especially in today's age, right? Uh, in today's time where, you know, disruption is, you know, it's, 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 it's happening so rapidly, right? I was just speaking to, you know, some students, uh, you know, who were taking computer science last week in, in, in uh, some universities. And, uh, you know, I was just telling them, you know, whatever coding you are studying right now in your first year, half of them would be, you know, useless when you graduate. You know, the rate of change is, 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 is so fast. Uh, and if you do not change, you will end up like the codecs of the world, you know, market leaders. And what happened to Kodak? You know, what happened to BlackBerry? What happened to Nokia, right? Uh, they resisted change because they were leaders. And because we are leaders, we have so much of market share, uh, you know, let other people change. We don't have to change. And remember disruption is generally caused by the smaller players, not the larger players. And we don't take them seriously and react. Uh, you know, we'll, we are in for big trouble, right? So, so please remember, uh, as a leader in your personal life or as a leader in your professional life, you got to be the best change agent. And do not worry about how people will perceive you because as long as the entire change initiative is data driven, you have logic behind bringing about change. No one, and, and you document that, you take in everybody's perspective, let it be a collective effort rather than top down, let it be bottom up. No one is gonna blame you for that change. But please remember, you know, um, you have to bring about change. Now, you would sometimes argue as a leader saying that, uh, you know, I don't want to bring about changes because when I look left and right, when I look at my friends who are leaders, you know, whenever they are leading change initiatives, the change initiatives fail. Now, let me tell you why change initiatives fail and only two reasons, right? People resist change because of lack of communication. They do not know what is gonna to happen to the organization or to them or their department after the change is implemented. Whenever you wanna bring about a change initiative, please remember that one thing you need to do is to over communicate. I'm not saying communicate, I'm saying over communicate, very, very important. And what do you need to communicate? Tell everyone, number one, acknowledge that if we don't change, we'll perish. That's why we have to change. Number two, right? What will happen to you after that change? And you have to over communicate that. And when you are implementing change initiatives within your organization, please use a distributed leadership model. Get as many people within your organization, you know, involved in bringing about change. Divide this res responsibility into small mini parts, into mini groups, right? And in those mini groups, make sure you have diversity within those groups. You should have people from different departments and different age groups in those small mini change initiatives, all right? So if I wanna bring about that big change in my organization, right? I will create small mini teams of four or five people, give them specific tasks. And this mini teams has to be cross-functional and, you know, uh, across the spectrum of different age groups and, and, and give them a responsibility. And when you do that, you are using distributed leadership model. And when you, when you over communicate the need to change and, and you ex 
exp explicitly and transparently tell them what's going to happen to them after the change. And you implement this change using a distributed leadership model, I am pretty sure your change initiatives will not fail, right? They fail because most leaders don't do that. It's just a top order, you know, it's just top bottom approach. We need to change and people are clueless, right? And obviously because of their anxiety, they're not going to support your change initiative. All right. So that's, that's mantra number two. Uh, you know, you need to be one of the best change agents possible. And even in your personal life as well, there's going to be a generation gap at some point. And if you don't proactively fail, if you don't proactively change, uh, market forces will force you to change. So you, you rather proactively and get credit for that change rather than be reactive later on, right? Um, point number three, you know, leadership mantra. Uh, what I've seen across the board is most leaders um, generally are overconfident you know uh, confidence is great you know as a leader you got to be confident but what i've realized from my observation you know most leaders are overconfident and when you're overconfident um, you have an optimistic assessment of your capabilities or your team's capabilities and you bite more than what you can chew right um, and, and, and because you're overconfident, uh, you generally also do not create contingencies for failure. What's your plan B? You know, I don't need a plan B because I will not fail. And you know, some leaders say, shub, shub, bolo, yaar. you know, I will not fail. But I said, what if you fail? No, 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 I will not fail. Henceforth, I don't need to think about failure, right? You know, I was, I, you know, that reminds me of, um, you know, um, almost a year back, I was addressing this group of entrepreneurs in one of the EO events. I can't remember whether it was an EO or a YPO event, but one of those events where there were a hundred entrepreneurs sitting in that hall in a, in a, in a fancy hotel. And uh, you know, I was giving a talk. And uh, the first question I asked all these entrepreneurs is, what is the base rate of entrepreneurial failure? I asked them this question. And you know, you know, different people volunteered and some said, you know, 50%, 60%, da, 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 da. And I then show them a, a, a report saying that uh, the base rate of entrepreneurial failure for those entrepreneurs who are having that mean level of, you know, uh, I think it was a 15 crore turnover, 15 and above turnover. So the base rate of entrepreneurial failure for that size is a whopping 92%. Now I revealed that statistics for them. And I told them, you know what this means? If I'm coming back, you know, after a year or maybe after two years, from the hundred of you, 92 of you would fail, right? Now, isn't this alarming? So I thought, you know, when I revealed this data, most of them would start sweating, you know, but instead, you know, they were just smiling over and I'm saying, are you not scared when I, you know, share these statistics with you? They said, no, we are not scared. I say, why are you not scared? Why are you not afraid? You know, I want to see some anxiety, man. And then the response I got is, sir, uh, we are not afraid because we belong in that 8%. You know, bad things don't happen to us. Bad things happen to my next door neighbors, right? So, and and, and because of this mindset that we have, that, uh, you know, we will, so, I mean, how many of you thought that you'll get COVID, for example, right? We, we think about COVID, uh, we, 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 you know, listen to the news, we, we, we read the papers, but most of us feel, Are, you know, COVID is for other people, my neighbor will get it. You know, the Samnevala society will get it, but I will not get COVID till, till it hits you, right? So, so, you know, being overconfident is another disease that we need to deal with. And because we are overconfident, we generally don't build contingencies for failure. What is your plan B? You know, a leader should always think for a plan B and a plan C, have that script ready in his or her drawer so that, right, in case of adversity, you need to activate your plan B. It's already ready. You have already thought about it. You know, you, you know what you're going to be doing. But when you think about your plan B, when adversity hits you, you're already, you know, at an emotional, you know, your, your mind is going through emotional turbulence. And when you're going through emotional turbulence, you will not be able to think about your plan B at that time. You rather think now a priori. So, so here's a reminder call for us not to be overconfident. And, and more importantly, building contingencies for failure. Now I'm using this word contingencies for failure, but what essentially I'm trying to say is de-risk, right? At every level. What if this employee leaves my organization? What am I going to do? What if this vendor stops, you know, uh, supplying me uh, the product? What am I going to do? What if this, uh, you know, customer of mine 
who contributes to you know 30% of my top line suddenly leaves me what if there's a disruption so at every level as a leader you need to think about de-risking right and whenever you you have your de-risk options in place you'll be so confident you will not have that palpitations of fear and people cannot take advantage of you right so so that's very important de-risking and uh, remove and that de-risking helps you become confident and and if you don't de-risk you are overconfident in my opinion right now um next thing i want to talk about is uh, you know as a leader you need to be able to influence people right uh, leadership is all about getting people to walk in the right direction you know creating strategies for your organization and ensure that everyone is aligned and everyone walks in a direction now people walks in a direction if they are intrinsically influenced right so your job as a leader is to influence people now the biggest mistake i've realized people make as leaders is they are, they take the sole responsibility in influencing everyone within the organization you know i need to influence this person that person at every level of the organization please remember as a leader you have to talk very little right let others do the talking for you what am i trying to say to be a great influencer as a leader you need to identify allies you know your people in different department who would spread your word on your behalf i'll give you a simple example right um um just imagine uh, that you are a uh, let's say uh, i'm a daughter and i have a very strict father you know my father loves me very much and he is overprotective about me and because he is overprotective about me uh, you know he has this um crazy house rules like curfew period so my dad tells me that uh, you know beta dishan let's assume i'm i'm a daughter uh, you know you have to come back home by 9 pm i don't care the world that we live in the city that we live in is not very safe so curfew period by 9 pm you better be back home you know i argue i deliberate with my father you know but he just doesn't listen to me now i realize that this stems from love and affection and hence for as a daughter i would say all right i'm abiding to your to your to your, to your rule book so i am home every day at 9 pm my dad is happy i am happy as a daughter everything is going on fine till one day my best friend is throwing a birthday party now guess what time this party starts right it starts at 11 pm and ends at 4 am in the morning now i am i am i really want to go right i want to party i am dying to get permission from my father i don't want to hide from my father so i want daddy to say yes you know as a leader you want your stakeholders to say yes it's a similar situation who are here daughter wants dad to say yes uh in your day to day operations you want your different stakeholders to say yes it's all about influence now i as a daughter if i want my dad to say yes and and give me the permission to go would i directly speak to daddy or would i try to influence mummy first right i would speak to mummy who's easily influenceable who's my my person in in that level there right i ask my mom that you know mom do you think i should go for this party i really want to go and mom says yes of course you have to go so i'll tell my mom you know if 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 you think i should be going why don't you speak to dad on my behalf now scenario 1 i could speak to my dad on my behalf or scenario 2 get my mom to speak on my behalf uh which which strategy is more effective right so the power of lateral influence is what i want want to talk about right so as a leader if you want to bring about effective changes within your organization you want to create momentum you need you need to rely on horizontal influence don't try to influence everyone across the table right no you got to have two or three people you know who are yours within every department get them to be convinced and if they are convinced tell them to influence their department chances of them saying yes is much more higher than you directly speaking to those people all right so the power of horizontal influence is something that you would want to utilize as a leader and henceforth you know let your allies do the talking for you internal allies external allies but you need to create a network of allies within your organization to be effective as a leader right uh, i'm not saying uh, you know want to be political but this is just uh, you know you can you know you can create this army of allies and uh, you know do good things for you or bad things for you that's your choice but i'm just talking about effectiveness as a leader you cannot you know uh, 
uh, run your agenda alone. You need people to be supporting you. And that is so important. And hence what networking internally is as important as networking externally as well. Okay, so that's my fourth point. Uh, things that we generally tend to omit or forget is this whole principle of influence using lateral influence and not vertical influence. Now, uh, my next point, which I want to talk about, is uh, you know the importance of you know having crucial conversations early and not later. You know, as you lead your troops, you know, as you lead the organization, obviously on a day-to-day -day basis, there will be some conflict with some people. Or there'll be something that really bugs you as a leader. You know, something that a, that a supplier said that you don't like, something that your boss said that you didn't like, something that a subordinate said that you really didn't like. It just really manifests inside, you know? And, and, and my strong recommendation to all of you is, you know, clear it out immediately. Do not delay crucial conversations. You know, I, I had a, a, a faculty colleague, uh, this story is almost, um, eight years ago when I was uh, teaching in, in the United States. And, and one, of, or one of my friends, you know, who was teaching in the university there with me, uh, you know, he has, he gets very irritated, you know. So during his executive education class, when a participant checks his or her mobile, he gets so pissed off, you know, that's something that is, you know, that is unique to him. And so I said, lay, you know, lay ground rules, yeah. Tell people not to, you know, check their mobiles. He says, no, no, no. You know, I will be appear. I will appear to be very, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, sensitive. Blah blah blah. I said then, fine. So he was narrating an incident where uh, you know he had a student sitting right in front, and he was delivering his lecture, and this student checked her mobile, uh, and this fellow got very irritated. But uh, but you know, after the class got over, he did not have that crucial conversation with her. He did not tell her that, hey, you know what? I get very pissed when you check your mobile when I'm teaching, don't do it. You know, he says, let it go, you know? But the fact is whenever we use the word, let it go, we actually intrinsically can't let it go. It is somewhere in our heart. It's still in our heart. We have not let it go. Now, then what happens? The next day he comes to class and he finds this student again, checking her mobile phone. Now he is like, oh, you know, I can't take this anymore, but he will not have this crucial conversation again. Right, he says, do, let it go. But many times, again, we tell ourselves, let it go. But the fact is, we have not let it go. We are still very irritated. Now, after his fourth class, when he finally could not take it anymore, he just approached that student, he snatched the phone and he threw it on the floor. He stamped the phone and he told that student that, you know what, I hate people checking their mobile phones when I'm teaching. Now, this is what happens when you delay crucial conversations. When you delay crucial conversations and when you have them later on, it takes up a monstrous form, right? With your spouse, with your loved ones, with, with whoever, you know, in a professional life, personal life, as a leader, please remember, do not delay crucial conversations. We can agree to disagree. What's wrong? And I should have the courage to tell you what I feel about it, right? And you should have that dignity to listen to me. Simple as that. Right, so, so it's very important to never delay crucial conversations. And a lot of leaders I know have delayed their crucial conversations and when they have it, you know, relationships get ruined. And this is applicable to your personal life as well with your children, your parents, your spouse, don't delay crucial conversations, okay? Uh, my next point to you um, is slightly different. And, and, and that point is, you know, do you need to be attractive to be a good leader? You know, uh, what makes you attractive? And, and, and the response is you need to be attractive, in my view. Now, how do you define being attractive? There are three points I would like you to take note. Right? As a leader, you know, uh, you got to be a good communicator. You know, communication competency is so important. You know, I know a lot of leaders who you know, somehow have a lot of meat in them. You know, they are, they are very capable, they are very competent, but they are just bad communicators. And if you're a bad communicator, you will not be able to articulate what you truly mean. And uh, as a result, uh, people will not be, uh, you know, motivated to follow you. So, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, what kind of training program should I get into? You know, I have 10 years of work experience, I've got 12 years of work experience, I would say communication skills program 
every year, both written and verbal. The better you are at communicating, you know, the more charismatic you'll perceive to be, right? So you need to be communicating empathically to be a good leader, okay? So what makes you attractive as a leader? Number one, strong communication skills, right? Uh, number two, your knowledgeability makes you very attractive. You know, we gravitate towards people who are knowledgeable. I mean, if you think about the opposite gender, we gravitate towards people who are generally attractive, right, physically. But uh, as a leader, you know, the same attraction, if you want people to gravitate towards you, if you want people to listen to you, if you want people, if you want to create followers, you got to showcase to them that you are knowledgeable. So when you meet your clients, when you meet anyone, don't only talk about issues at the table, you know, showcase your knowledgeability by talking about international markets, talk about disruption, you know, talk about, uh, you know, um, new value propositions. The other person, whoever, you know, uh, you are interacting with should feel that this person has breadth of knowledge with depth. And if you are able to showcase breadth of knowledge as a leader, you are perceived to be knowledgeable with depth, right? And then when you are perceived to be knowledgeable, people will gravitate towards you. And that's why, you know, I'm in love with interdisciplinary education. I'm loving what I'm doing at Flame University, right? Because the entire, you know, interdisciplinary approach towards education, you know, is preparing our students to be good leaders, right? Uh, because we focus on communication, we focus on breadth of knowledge and, and blah, blah, blah. Third point, what makes you attractive as a leader is your humility. You know, so three things, if you want to be attractive, and then you have to be attractive as a leader, communication skills, communication competency, number one, number two, knowledgeability, and number three, humility. You know, I talked about ego and at, the, at, the, at the starting of, of my talk. It is so important, you know, uh, you, know you have to showcase humility. Uh, you know, humility is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. You can be assertive, Right? As a leader, you've got to be assertive. You've got to you know, create that imaginary finishing line for your people, stretch targets for your people, and be assertive about it. But there's a way to communicate that assertion with respect and humility. Right? So I'm not saying you know, uh, you know, humility means be less assertive. No. I'm talking about ego here. I'm talking about arrogance here. Remove that. I mean, what's wrong if you are just breathtakingly nice? What's wrong? Right, you know, most people have this, you know, misconstrued perception about leadership. You know that I got to be tight. You know, I got to be straight, and you know, people should be just respecting me, should be saluting me when I'm going. They got to be less leading by fear. Right, uh, when you lead by fear, people are not intrinsically motivated, and people respect you for not what you are, but for on the for for the title that that, that you possess. Now you want people to be respecting you for, for what you are and not the seat that you are sitting on. And for that, you know, humility is extremely, extremely uh, important. You know, I mean, people ask me, you know, you know, how do you define integrity, right? Uh, we talk about integrity all the time. And I would say integrity is nothing but humility plus courage. That is integrity, right? So, um, so yes, be attractive. And that is extremely important. Uh, the next point I want to talk about is the importance of building trust. That's the bedrock, right? If you want people to follow you, if you want people to be intrinsically motivated, if you want people to listen to what you say, you know, they're going to do it. If, you know, like one, they'll do it. Either they are afraid of you, leading via paranoia. And I know a lot of leaders who do that, but that is not sustainable. That is not sustainable. Right. And, you know, leadership is a position that comes, you know, uh, I mean, you should be grateful to be a leader. It is a chance for you to make a difference to other people. Right. And you have to serve other people, give them growth as a leader, you know, rather than leading via paranoia and making them scared of you. What's the point? So I want to talk about uh, building trust and I want to simplify trust for all of you. You know, if you want people to trust you, you have to display three attributes. Number one, integrity, right? So think about people that you trust. Anyone, right? Think about that five names that is in your mind right now, right? My, my best friend, my colleague, my supplier, my spouse, whoever that you trust, 
I'm pretty sure that they will display one of these three attributes, okay? So if you, if you want people to trust you, number one, you have to display integrity, right? This person walks his or her talk. If I make a commitment, I will deliver, right? So, so integrity is very important. If you want people to trust you, you have to show competence. I trust you because I know you have the competency to deliver. So integrity builds trust, competency builds trust. Now, what is the third factor that builds trust? Benevolence. I trust you because I think you genuinely care about my well-being. That's why I trust you, All right? Why do you trust your spouse? It's benevolence because you think your spouse, for example, is genuinely caring about your well-being and henceforth you reciprocate by trusting her or him, right? So, so as a leader, you want to garner trust. And trust gets built if you display integrity as a leader, you display, display competence as a leader, which we talked about in a few moments ago, which was knowledgeability. And you display uh, benevolence, right? So uh, like I said, uh, the starting point of leadership is, is building trust and you have to cleanse yourself and ask yourself, do people trust me? Am I displaying one of these three attributes? Okay. Um, the next point I want to talk about is a very important one, which is pretty common. You know, a lot of people talk about this, but I just want to remind you the importance of allowing people to fail. You know, think about the leaders that you respect. You know, think about all the leaders that you respect. You know, uh, their failure made them what they are. Now, if you are tuned in today as an audience, and if you are very successful as a leader, and if I ask you what made you successful, you'd say, you know, if I had not failed, I wouldn't have learned, and that would not make me what I am today. So allow your people to gravitate around the mean. See, you know, I have you know, known a lot of head of sales. So I, I you know, I so I've interacted with so many head of sales and I hear horror stories, you know. So they set, they set stretch targets for their people, right? So it says, all right, your stretch target is you have to sell 10 items of this by end of this month, for example, 10 items, right? So, so this, they, they set stretch targets and their people work very hard. So let's say, uh, you know, someone work hard for me and, and meets my target. Instead of selling 10, this person sells 11. Now, what do I do next immediately? I create stretch targets. Abhi next month, aapka target hai, you have to sell 12, right? Because you could deliver 11. You know, I, and this person works very hard and delivers 11 the next month. And for the third month, I keep the same target and this person sells 11 the third month, but in the fourth month, this person sells only five items. Now, what am I gonna to say to this person in the fourth month? Your performance has deteriorated. But no, it has not deteriorated because I, I have a wrong benchmark in evaluating your performance. I have to understand that everybody gravitates around the mean. It's like the stock market. You know, the stock market has a mean trend line, which is upward sloping, but the market goes up and down, up and down, up and down. So when I want to measure someone, I have to look at the mean level of performance. And if your performance is below your mean, then I would be reprimanding you and say, what's happening? And my job is to make you successful, right? But what we do is, you know, we think that the linear graph is just going up and up, why on why? And that's not possible, right? So, so I mean, think about the way we, we set expectations for our children. You know, I remember uh, my dad, you know, when I, was, when, I, when I was young, you know, he says, you, you have to get me 80 out of 100 in mathematics. You know, I work very hard and I used to get around 50 only worked very hard, got 80, and he was so delighted. And what he did immediately, he says, beta, you know, next test, you need to get 90. And I worked very hard, you know, worked very hard. And I, 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 meet, I met that performance, you know, I got 90 out of 100. Next thing I realized, my dad is saying 95. I met 95. And in my next test, guess what I got? I got 55. And guess what happened to me? My dad almost killed me, right? He says, your performance has deteriorated, right? Uh, but I think uh, he should allow me to probably, I hope my dad is listening to me right now, all right? But, uh, you, know, I, you know, he should have actually allowed me to take two or three more tests before making a judgment on my performance. And, and remember, I have my mean level of performance and you should only worry if I'm below my mean. And that's another mistake that leaders make. They do not regress expectations along the mean. 
right? And they start reprimanding you the moment you tip after a high. And then I want to remind all leaders out there, please remember, have a longitudinal perspective before you make judgments about your employees' performance, okay? Um, my next point, which I want to talk about revolves around, you know, being uh, as a leader, and this has got to do with, you know, with, a, with a, the spiritual bent here, but I think it's very important. Leaders have to embrace some form of spirituality and mindfulness. And spiritual and mindfulness has a common lesson, which is live in the present. You know, I saw a YouTube video. Okay, I saw this YouTube video, very interesting. You know, father and son leaving home early in the morning. Okay, and the son has a very busy day, you know, goes for basketball practice, goes for swimming practice, goes to school, goes for tuitions after school, and then comes back slosh tired at around 7 p.m. And Father's Day is described by, you know, sitting in his air-conditioned car, going to his air-conditioned office, and, uh, you know, having lunch in his air-conditioned cafeteria, having a, a meeting in his air-conditioned conference room, and coming back home in his chauffeur-driven air-conditioned car. And father comes home at 7 o'clock. So son is so excited to see father coming back early today at 7 p.m. And son tells father, dad, you are home early today. And dad says, yes, I am home early. And then the next pitch the, son's, the son makes is, daddy, let's play basketball. And let's get what the father says. I'm busy. I'm tired. So not busy. Sorry. I'm tired. Now, what has made you tired? You're just sitting all day, right? What has made you tired? You're not physically tired. You are mentally tired, right? And what makes you mentally exhausted is because you are thinking about things you cannot control. promotion Focus on the effort and then let the time decide, right? But you're thinking about things. So whenever you face palpitations, Please remember, it's always when you're thinking about things you cannot control. Either you're in the future or you're in the past. But whenever you are in the present, you'll be like your child, full of energy. Right? So here's a reminder call to all my leaders. Yes, you strategize for the future. You plan for the future. And you start working towards the future of your organization. But don't be too bogged down about the results. As long as you're giving your best shot, you've got all your data present, you've got your team with you, you all are working hard. Just, just move on. But most leaders are so stressed up about, will I meet my targets? Will my people meet my targets? What's going to happen to me if I don't meet my targets? What's going to happen to me if I don't get my promotion? Blah, blah, blah. And you are just ruining a lot of your mental energy thinking about things you can't control. When you think about things you can control, you face palpitations. When you feel palpitations, you are tired. And when you're tired, you, can't live, you cannot live effectively. All right? So here's a reminder call for you to live in the present. Very, very important point. Okay, so that is, uh, you know, focusing on what you can control, which is the present. Don't worry about the past and future. Now, um, you know, I, I need to keep some time for questions, but I'm going to just talk about two more points and then I will stop there. Uh, two more very important points. And, uh, you know, um, you know, as a leader, please remember, you cannot be a people pleaser. You know, as if you say, look, I'm a lower level manager, then fine, you know, worry about who thinks what within your organization, then align your steps based on, uh, you know, perception of others, because you want to ingratiate yourself, you know, you want to look good at, at you know, uh, based on perception of others. But, you know, as you rise up the ladder, as you are taking that journey, you should also remind yourself that as I go up, I should be less bothered about how I'm being perceived. But the reverse is true, unfortunately. You know, most leaders, you know, they rise up and, you know, they worry about popularity. And when you worry about how you're being perceived, when you worry about popularity uh, and you want to be liked by everyone, you cannot take tough calls. You cannot bring about change initiatives within your organization. So it is a balance between being right versus being liked. And all I'm saying is, you want to be liked for being right, for being consistent. Who says leadership is easy? It's, it's a tough call to be a leader. And usually leaders are so-called lonely at the top. Why? Because you have to take, you know, discomforting decisions that may not, uh, you know, resonate well with your subordinates. But so be it. If it is good for the organization, you have to take that call. But if you are a people pleaser, you will not be able to take the call. 
right? Now, now let me tell all the people pleasers one thing. Okay, let's 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 take let's let's uh, think of an analogy. Let's say you are in France right now, and behind you there's an Eiffel Tower. What is the first thing you will do? You will take a selfie shot, right? And that too, you know, with your with your loved ones next to you, your children, your spouse, and you know, kaske, you take a nice selfie shot. Now you cannot keep still after that. You know, you cannot keep that photo for your personal repository. What will you do next after taking that selfie shot? You will post it in all the social media platform, Facebook and Insta and blah blah blah. Now, why do you do that? Why do you post your personal pictures in in in, for example, Facebook? Because you you are living in this mythical world, thinking that my two thousand friends that I have will be happy for my well-being when they view my happy my when they when they see my happy photograph, right? So, are you actually generating happiness or envy? You got the answer, right? How many of the two thousand friends would actually be happy for your well-being, right? Maybe you can count with these two hands here. Now, how so? Which means how many true well wishes do you have? And what do you do as a leader? You actually messed up your life by trying to appease all these people who actually don't matter, right? So, so please remember. You know, you have to think about those few who matter, and maybe ingratiate yourself towards them. Otherwise, don't worry about who thinks what about you because they are not your true well wishes. End of the day, you know they'll be envious of your growth, right? And 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 we we know, you know, uh, the politics of leadership. There are so many people who are dying to pull you down, right? But at the same time, that comes to my next point. You know, do not be insecure. Please remember. your job as a leader and why you should not be insecure let me tell you one thing so i read a, a a research article in the internet can't remember the site right now but probably we will post it somewhere uh, so it's 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 a it's a, it's a, it's a research article that talked about uh, you know the entire world population and the data very interestingly revealed to us that if your salary is more than 34000 us dollars per annum right so which means this is around 25 lakhs or 27 lakhs whatever the you know exchange rate you want to count now if you are earning more than 25 lakhs for example ctc per annum you are amongst the top 1 percentile of the entire humanity did you know this so if you if you draw the pyramid of wealth and if you are drawing a ctc of more than 25 lakhs per annum you are amongst the top 1 percentile and most leaders are drawing much more right now there are billions of people down there below you who are dying to trade places with you there are billions of people whose daily puja is you know what if i just can be like this leader you know i'll be so thankful to you almighty if i can have one tenth of what this leader has i'll be so thankful to you almighty you know we all have been blessed first blessing is you know uh, getting the opportunity to be a leader which means you can make a difference to people the second blessing is being paid to be in the top 1 percentile of humanity i think that should open our eyes and and you know we should embrace tons of gratitude and remove insecurity because there are more competent people than me who deserve this position but you know somehow by luck i got into this position now that i got into this position i want to make clones like me people reporting to me my job is to make sure that they get growth that i make them as successful as i am that's your job as a leader right and not be insecure when you see talent in your organization and try to stumble them what's the point then then you, you know you 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 messed up the opportunity of making a difference you know as a leader you know, we we generally talk about making a difference to society and people around us when we retire but if you are a leader in your organization you don't have to wait till you retire to make a difference you can immediately make a difference to people's life so my my humble request to all my leaders out there you know recognize that this is a position you know that you are fortunate to get into recognize that you know you just look at the the data point which i just talked about you are amongst the top 1 percentile in humanity right uh, billions of people dying to be in your position and dying to earn what you have make a difference man make a difference as a leader rather than resenting other people's success that's what we do you know 
uh, and then we develop so much of insecurity. You know, life only comes once. And uh, as a leader, you know, we are very fortunate to be in a position to make a difference. Give your best shot in making a difference and make people more successful than you, right? And that's the job of a true leader, right? I think time is running up. Uh, I told Neeraj and, you know, Darshan that I will speak for half an hour, but I just went on and on and it's almost one hour. So my apologies, but uh, I got carried away. But I hope that uh, these nuggets of knowledge have been useful. Uh, I've tried to make it as practical as possible. And I hope that you can relate to these learnings in both your personal and professional life. And, uh, you know, uh, before I take on questions, uh, my last point would be, you know, the importance of being happy, you know, the, the importance of positivity. You know, if you, if you don't smile, you can't make other people smile. You know, I cannot be dragging my feet on the floor and complaining about life to my wife. And then after dinner, asking her, why are you not smiling? You know, if I wanted to smile, I would have smiled first. So similarly, if you want your people to smile, if you want them to be happy, if you want them to embrace positivity, you have to embrace it first, right? So I wish every one of you continued success and, uh, you know, do continue to make a difference to as many people as you can. And, and, and I hope that uh, these cleansing moments have been useful to all of you. God bless you. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, sir. That was uh, very enlightening as well. Uh, and to the audience, please keep your questions coming on the uh, chat. Uh, sir, uh, just one one question. I think uh, it's come up in my mind uh, as we were talking about. Uh, while we wait for the audiences, uh, yeah, we, we've got one question from Akash Loda. Uh, Akash uh, uh, talks about uh, could you please touch upon great negotiation skills uh, to be an influential leader? Well, uh, you know, leadership, uh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the word negotiation is a misnomer, right? Uh, so let me paraphrase negotiation, right? A negotiation is nothing but your ability to get to yes or get past no. So when you're negotiating, right, it's all about, you know, getting someone who's saying no to you to say yes, or getting someone to say yes to you. Right. Right? So this is how I would define negotiation, getting to yes or getting past no. Now, and to be able to get to yes or get past no, you need to be one of the best influencers. Now, what does a leader do, right? A leader also has to be one of the best influencers to get to yes or get past no, right? So, you know, many times when I'm teaching leadership, I'm actually delivering a negotiations program because it's all about influencing people. So I think, you know, uh, we all have a very narrow facet conceptualization or definition or understanding of negotiation. Actually, it's about influence and leadership is also about influence. Right. So yes, uh, a good leader has to be a good influencer slash negotiator. I agree. Agreed, sir. I think a couple of points have uh, resonated very well with, uh, you know, what, what uh, we've been seeing in the last year or so with the difficult times coming in and I, I think uh, leading with purpose is become uh, at the center of leadership uh, now. So, you know, uh, anything that you would want to comment, how, how does one lead with purpose and more importantly, the second part, everyone talked about leading with purpose, but how do you make your entire, you know, for lack of better word, percolated within the organization, uh, the same purpose which you would want uh, to go ahead with? Yeah. I, again, another brilliant question. Uh, and like I said, you know, leadership is over glorified. And I think we have over glorified purpose also. I think it has got to do with communication and communicating that purpose. Right. But yes, um, having purpose is extremely important. So, first of all, defining the purpose of the organization what do we stand for? And what do we want to do in the next three years? And why? So, you know, understanding purpose requires us, and I'd say this in my talk as well, moving from what to why. So, so, but coming up with the purpose of the organization has to be a collective effort. It cannot be, you know, top down. It has to be bottom up through a lot of deliberation. Now, if you 
create your purpose bottoms up. So first, I'm, I'm talking about purpose of the organization, right? What do we stand for, right? So Reliance has its own purpose. Tata's have their own purpose. You know, the Aditya Builder Group have their own purpose. Every organization has their own right. purpose. Yeah. Now, but if you are leading as an entrepreneur, for example, you have to create the the uh, the purpose bottom up, co-created purpose, and then align yourself with your organization's sense of purpose, and that's where you find your true meaning, right? So many times, what happens is, uh, you know, my organization has a purpose, but it is not aligned with my sense of purpose. So you know, in HR, we talk about PO fit, person organization fit. There has to be a fit with that purpose as well. What do my organization stand for and what do I want to do? Get that alignment right first. That's point number one. And number two, you know, articulating that purpose is key. Now, uh, and, and when, when we talk about purpose, it's all about helping people find meaning about the job that they do. The why is very important. I'll give you a very simple example. You know, um, you know, before. You know, for, for, for diabetes patient, there was there's this injection, the pen injection that has right. been, you know, so there was an innovation, I think that got out 10 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, right? Now, when that, so there was this uh, medical company in United States that manufactured this product, they were the innovators. But, you know, it's such a rudimentary task for their people, you know, they are sitting in the assembly line, just fixing things and, and, and it is a very monotonous job. They were not intrinsically motivated. So the, the leader in that organization one day brought in a lady who is diabetic and she basically hugged and thanked everyone in the assembly line. She showed her hands saying that I'm a diabetic patient. Before this innovation was created, I had to cut my fingers three times a day. And now my fingers are all bleeding and I can't even hold you know, uh, even a glass of water. Right. Thanks to your company and thanks to your effort, today my life has changed. Now, all the people in the assembly line are intrinsically motivated because they know the purpose behind what they're doing. It's making a difference to people. Right? And that's what you need to do. Great, sir. Uh, I, we, we don't have time for too many questions, but uh, a lot of them have come in. A lot of them want you to have uh, extend the session or have the session once again. Uh, so I'm going to ask Madhuri and Darshan to look at that feasibility as well. But uh, there's one one question from uh, Fatima who uh, talks about how do you work under a leader who is making you uh, work with unrealistic goals, you know, hard to say no. Uh, and because of them, many other uh, employees have already left. <clears throat> right. So it's no, uh, perhaps not directly linked to leadership. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think, you know, most leaders mm -hmm. do set stretch targets, but uh, but those stretch targets have to be realistic. And I mean, that's part of goal setting theory, right? That's part of motivation. Uh, right. But uh, yes, I, I do know a lot of leaders that set very unrealistic targets. Now, you as an employee, you feel very, very claustrophobic and you want to tell, but you can't tell because usko bura lag jayega. So there are two problems out here, right? Uh, we should have the courage to speak up, the courage to voice. And I have seen in Indian organizations, typically the reward is towards yes men or yes women. People who say yes, you know, uh, they get promoted. And people who, who dare to challenge the status quo, people who come up with ideas, you know, which are, you know, uh, out of the box, they are labeled as squeaky wheels, right? Now, End of the day, organizations become innovative when they have these creative people who always question the status quo. And those are the people you should value. But unfortunately, you reward your yes man. Now she's going through the same problem here. Now, how do I tell my leader? I think two things. Before you tell your leader, you have to ask yourself, what is my anxiety building up from? The fact that, you know, if this guy doesn't like me, I will have to leave. So create your backup plan first. Remember, I just talked about de-risking. So what is your plan B first? What is your alternative? Grab your alternative. Once you have an alternative, you have courage. And that's a time for you to have a crucial conversation. That you know, boss, this is not right. And if you do not re-anchor the targets, I'm going to leave because I think you are out of your mind. So then you have, you know, your body language is going to be very positive and confident. But if you do not have a backup plan, you have this conversation, your body language is going to be fearful and you'd rather not have this conversation. 
True. Thanks, sir. So, should we take one last question? I know. Uh, uh, would you want to look at the Q&A and pick one or? No, you, I, you please. Okay. So, uh, last question, I think I'll, I'll pick up uh, uh, Tejashree's question. I think she asked about how does one manage having good work relationships and at the same time ensure that you are not a people pleaser? So, you know, uh, what is the definition of having a good work relationship, right? So when you say having good work relationship, I am assuming that comes from you helping other people when they need help, you collaborating with them when they need your inputs. And when you start empathizing with your colleagues, when you start respecting your colleagues, right? Uh, respecting doesn't mean just saying yes to whatever they want you to do so, right? Yeah. So, so when you give a helping hand, when you collaborate, when you empathize, when you respect people, when you display some form of humility, people are going to be respecting you. And henceforth, that's the key to your good work relationship. But at the same time, people should not abuse your goodness by taking advantage of you. And that's where, you know, having that courage is very important. So I respect you, for example, but at the same time, you have to communicate to people that, look, we are here for a higher ordinate need. And we are all here to get our departments or our organization to be successful. True. And the favor that you are asking me or the things that you want me to sign off, right? So I'm wearing my personal cap and my professional cap now. Personally, I'll help you and I am always there for you. But having that responsibility within my division, when I put on my professional cap, I don't think this decision aligns myself with what I need to do sure. in my department. And you have to very openly and transparently say that. Right. I had one standoff today only. I won't mention where I had to do the same thing. Right. And I had to tell that person, look, yeah, I'm wearing my professional cap and that requires me to take certain decisions. And I'm really sorry. Right. I'm willing to help you however I can, but you need to understand my constraint as well. And let us all be aligned with the organization. Goals. Great, sir. Uh, I think we'll, we'll stop. There are lots of questions here. So apologies to all these uh, uh, attendees who have asked the question, but we're not able to answer them. Uh, you know, uh, so let me simply sum up uh, Anil Dankar uh, ji here. Uh, he's, he's summed up your session pretty well. He says, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, it's John C. Maxwell's uh, quote, but I think that pretty much sums up the, the session that you've done. Once again, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Dishan Kamdar on behalf of uh, everyone here at Flame and Center for Entrepreneurship Innovation for this wonderful session. Uh, thank you, sir. Have a good thank evening. You. Thank you. And, uh, thanks to all all our attendees for coming, listening, joining, and uh, asking such a lot of questions. Uh, our next uh, Founders Talk session, the details of that is, is there on your screen. Uh, do register for these sessions, uh, your story, and uh, Mr. Bhaskar will be speaking with us uh, then. So thank you so much all of you for attending. Have a good evening and goodbye. Thank you, sir. Yeah, welcome.